see. Man, this screen, unbelievable. Okay. Guys, I'm trying to work this screen somehow. Let's see. Oh, good. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's working. What's happening, everybody? Yes, there's only one st story of Lot that's in Genesis. I mean, Lot is mentioned in Second Peter, right? But as far as the story is concerned, it's only in Genesis. So, folks, welcome. We're just going to wait a few more minutes till the regular folks show up. Hopefully, if the Lord Jesus is pleased, we can get it over 100. I know it sounds like I want numbers, right? As long as David Wood gets 1,000, I'm going to be jealous, right? Even though I have stated it, I'm going to state it again. People keep asking me if there's some beef between David Wood and I. All right, hopefully. Let's see. I hope it goes well. Pray for the internet connection in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, bless this session. Uh, I guess uh, the bantering between David Wood and I, people don't get it. David Wood and I are brothers for life. David Wood and I have been brought together by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you know for the glory of Jesus Christ. David Wood and I have been sealed by the bond of the Holy Spirit, and I pray the Holy Spirit will preserve us for the glory of Jesus Christ and perfect our unity to keep working together to glorify Jesus Christ and destroy Islam so Muslims get saved. So I don't know why people keep asking me if there's problems between David Wood and I. I guess some Christians are just too serious. They don't know that you can be a Christian and joke and banter back and forth, right? So no, David Wood is good, even though he's a hater. He's jealous and envious of me, and he makes more money than me. But still, I love the brother. We'll just wait for a few more faces to show up. Just people have been asking me about yesterday. I still have a few obstacles in my path, few obstacles that I truly need you to pray. Keep praying and fasting for my daughters and I, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the, by the blood of Jesus Christ, these few obstacles will be destroyed and removed. But I can tell you that yesterday went pleasant because I was given permission. I can relocate. I don't want to mention the state. So I'm free to relocate, and I'm hoping to do so in a couple weeks. But now I need to get permission from the state. Can you pray that God will move sovereignly and that I'll get permission from the other state? And then in a couple of weeks, I'm gone. I hate when there's a delay. Can you hear me? Pray that there's no delay. Crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, and save me from my unrighteous anger, Lord. Man, I, I have so many weaknesses. Zina, why don't you just give them my address and give them my telephone number? Why don't you even tell them where my daughters live? Hey, Zina, don't you live in Michigan? Oh, boy. Can you give me your address, uh, Zena, so I can advertise it too? Oh, okay. At least you're honest. <laughs> All right. She's bold, bolder than I thought. Choose Jesus. Do you have to live with her every day, man? Great is your reward, huh? Choose Jesus. Great is your reward because of her. But keep praying for me. I got permission from this side to re relocate. Pray for God's grace and mercy to be poured out and i get favor and i get the answer within a couple weeks because i i want to go no it's not that it's a secret Zena. i don't want certain people to know my exact whereabouts because i don't want them to bother me and pester me if, if i have to spell it out you know i don't know and it's not muslims i don't care about muslims it's not the muslims i don't want certain people to know my whereabouts, even though they know. I mean, to be honest, they know, so maybe it doesn't matter. And another reason why I don't want to just come out and say where I'm going is not so much because of me, because I don't want to get people in trouble that are affiliated with me. Not everyone wants others to know their connection, association with me for their safety, right? As far as I'm concerned, I don't care. If I cared, I wouldn't be out and about in the public I wouldn't be going to Muslim <clears throat> cities and towns. You know, I don't care. That's one thing about this group that God has raised up. I thank God that's because of the grace of Jesus Christ. That's because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And again, I'm going to say that's because of the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit filling us. David Wood, Vocab Malone, 
John, what do you mean? Even Adam Coleman, myself, don't care. We're not afraid. And that's because of the Lord Jesus giving us the grace and the power not to be afraid. Because one thing Satan wants, let me share something with you guys. One thing Satan wants is to, for us to be afraid because if you're afraid, that paralyzes you. So Satan wants to paralyze you, right? Make you afraid so that you're not effective and glorifying Jesus Christ. And that shows lack of trust in Jesus. I'm not saying be stupid, be wise as serpents, innocent as doves, but we need to be bold. Like one person asked me one time, do you have bodyguards? I said, for what? Did the apostles have bodyguards? I cannot hold the candlestick when it compares to Paul. I, in fact, Paul is just a human creature, a finite sinner, now glorified in the presence of Jesus Christ. But I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. And he's nothing in comparison to Jesus. And did Paul have bodyguards? He had angelic bodyguards. He had spirit creatures assigned to him. Right? This is why sometimes it shocks me. I see some local pastors. They got bodyguards lined up as if they're, you know, anyway. Exactly choose Jesus. All right. You know, anyway, I don't know. I see some pastors, they got bodyguards. And I'm like, who's going to kill you? What are you doing to make people want to kill you? And these are pastors that are living in mansions, you know, million dollar home, making money, fleecing the people of God, right? You are Mio Paul, my brother. Sorry about my I don't have no I don't know what Mio Paul is, but if it's good, I'll take that. Mio, what's up, brother? Wait a few more minutes. I guess Protestant believers here. You just gotta thank the Lord Jesus for the weather because it's a rainy, gloomy day. I decided I'm gonna come and do a live stream. So thank Jesus for this weather. Because I was in the mood just to drive and listen to some music. I'm in one of those moods. I'm in a melancholy mood, right? Where I just want to sit, you know. I'm very melancholy, you know. Just keep praying for me because one thing I can tell you, and the Lord knows, I truly love and adore my two angels, my my daughters. After Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ granting me the gift of salvation to know him and love him, the greatest gift of, after that is these two angels that he gave me. I love them. I love them. And when they were with me, the world was mine, putting them to sleep, waking up to them. Having them run up to me and kiss me and me just kiss them and love them and affirm them and having them call me Baba. The world was mine, right? But, you know, right now, we, you know, it's, it's, we live in a fallen world and they haven't seen me and I haven't seen them. But you know what? Jesus loves them more than I can imagine. And Jesus will protect them and he'll fight for them because I can't do it. I can't. You know, I'll lose the system. Listen, folks, I just got to be honest and speak from my heart. I know a lot, a lot of people don't like me and hate me, and I don't blame them because of my impatience and my anger issues. I can, you know, step on a lot of toes, and I pray God, you know, gives me the grace not to do it unnecessarily. The world we live in is so corrupt and evil. It is so corrupt and evil, right? The judicial system is so corrupt and evil that the judicial system is set up to destroy men. Now, there are some men who are deadbeats, you know, dads who are just garbage, don't care. I'm not one of them, you know. I wanted to be with them until they grow up, and then I, my prayer was, Lord Jesus, let me die before anything happens to them. But that's the world we live in, right? So... Just pray for them because they need a Baba and I can't be there right now. I can't. I just have to let go. I just have to let go. Choose Jesus, man. Uh, the way she's, she's like fiery and feisty, man. I, I know you're praying like, please let her get married sooner than later. But keep praying. Tell me about it, Do Dominos. Tell us some. The judge destroyed me. You think I'm rich. I'm a millionaire and I have a money tree. Zina, that's what you say now. The time will come. You're going to say, God, please bring me a godly man. Oh, I just want a beautiful, gorgeous Middle Eastern hunk that loves you, Jesus. But he's got to have muscles, and he's got to have a flat stomach. And as long as he loves you, then I'll marry him, Jesus. Jesus. All right. Are you guys ready? I was asked to discuss...
the Trinity in the Hebrew Bible, specifically in Genesis chapters 18 to 19. Keep praying for me, will you? Again, let me repeat. Oh, man, if you sound like that, Zena, it's going to be a long time before you get married. If you sound like this, yes, help me. It's going to be very hard to get married with a voice like that. You know, I, can you imagine? <laughs> you have a, vo a wife that speaks like that and she looks at you. Hi, hey, dear. I just love you. You're just my world. Can we pray? No, I don't think so. Why don't you take a vow of silence? Okay. Anyway. Anyway, just to remind you, glory to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Yesterday, I got permission by the grace of the Lord. I can relocate, but now I need permission from the other state. Can you now pray for that? Please beg the Lord. Please, Lord Jesus, set me free. Let me get permission within two weeks. And I promise you, okay, in two weeks, I'll be relocating. So in Jesus' name and trust the Lord will bring my little angels. I know you're crying right now. But I mean, you know, she said that's how she sounds, right? She's like, that's my voice. Can you imagine? She wakes up in the morning. You, you're so handsome. I thank the Lord. You're my husband. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'd say, Lord, take me home. Please. This is purgatory. Okay. All right. Pray that, th that I get permission from the other side, and then, Lord willing, I'll be systematically going through subject by subject, topic by topic. I promise you we're going to continue decimating the argument that Jesus is the Archangel Michael, and we'll go into other topics because I'd like to teach on the gospel fully. What is the gospel? Salvation, holiness, obedience, you know, and other issues that plague us today, all right? So pray for me that the Spirit will fill me with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and that the Holy Spirit will then give us the power not just to understand, but to apply perfectly in our lives to glorify Jesus Christ before the world until the Lord comes or we go home, right? So are we ready? Are we in the saddle? I hope we get 200 today. Lord, be glorified in Jesus' name. Come on! Let's bring it up. We want 200. All right. Are we ready? Because first and last, ask me about the trinity in genesis chapter 18 and 19 so i'm going to pray we're going to begin genesis chapters 18 to 19 we'll talk about that we'll talk about other theophanies right theophanies i'm using a technical term created by christians a theophany means an appearance of god it's not buffering on my end it's buffering on your end do do how right a theophany means an appearance of god right theos phaneo Theos, Theos, Theos. So let me help you guys understand some of the language here. Okay, so we got, can we send Salmon Player to Mecca to kiss the black stone like a pagan? All right. Anyway, let's come back. Let me explain some technical terms. Theophany means appearance of God. Christophany means an appearance of Christ. So when you when we speak of theophanies or Christophanies, we mean visible appearances of God or appearances of Jesus Christ in the Hebrew Bible, right? So typically, normally, when we say theophany, we mean God appearing visibly in the Hebrew Bible, right? And we talk about Christophanies, Christophany, meaning appearances of Jesus Christ in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, right? You guys with me so far? You understand what a theophany is and a Christophany is? Christophany, the, most of our theological terms come from the Greek through the Latin, either directly from the Greek or Greek through the Latin, because remember, the New Testament was written in Greek, and for the most part, especially during the medieval period, the linguistic, the scholastic, the theological language of the West was Latin. So if you actually trace the root of these words, they either come from the Greek directly or Greek through Latin. Even the word Bible, I don't know if you know this. The term Bible comes from the Latin Biblia, which means book. And Biblia itself comes from Greek, Biblos. So when you speak of the Holy Bible, you're simply speaking of the Holy Book. Did you know that? Theology, that's two Greek words. Theos, right? Logos. Theos, logos, right? Right? So theophany is theos, phaneo, 
Christophany, Christos, Christos, Phaneo, appearances of Christ in the Hebrew Bible, appearances of God in the Hebrew Bible. So I hope that's clear, right? Is that clear? Is that clear to everyone? So we can begin. I hope this topic will bless you. It will challenge you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will stand in awe of the Bible, how real God is, and that truly this is his word, and that our God is triune, and that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. So we thank you, Father. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, I ask that you comfort us right now, especially me, Lord. And I pray that you just rejuvenate me, rejuvenate every one of us. We are tired either physically because of work or we're tired because of issues in our lives, problems in our lives. So, Father, please refresh us by your spirit. Refresh us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically, Father, for the glory of Jesus Christ, for the sake of your Son. And, Father, fill us with your spirit. Just, just flood us in the presence of your spirit, your living waters. Fill us with the living waters, your Holy Spirit, Father. And I pray you do that for our loved ones. In my case, my two angels. You are their father, and you love them more than I can imagine, and you love us more than I can imagine, than we can imagine, Father. So bless us and our loved ones, and bless my daughters, and cover them, cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus. Shield us with the blood of Jesus. Seal us by the Spirit, and fill us with the Spirit, Father. And Father, just refresh me so I can refresh your servants, your children, your household, who are here to hear your word, not me, Father. And as the brother said, not just less of me, more than Jesus, none of me and all of Jesus. May Christ completely consume us and take over and he'll be glorified. Anoint the words of my mouth to speak truth without error and speak it clearly. Save me from confusion, stammering. Bless them to understand, Father, with wisdom and knowledge from your Holy Spirit. Please, Abba. Please, Bobby. For the sake of your son, Lord, the Lord Jesus, and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father, and use this session mightily and fill us with the with the breath of life. Fill me with the breath of life, my lungs, my chest, my throat, with the health I need to glorify you and grant us the holiness that we need to satisfy you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way and please protect us from distractions in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay. Are we ready? Are we ready by the grace of God? All right. He wants me to break down Genesis 18. Now, there are two interpretations of Genesis 18, but I do need you to listen. And people ask me, and I'm going to repeat again. Why do I engage the comments? Why don't I, why, why don't I simply ignore them? Let me repeat it again so hopefully people understand. The reason why I look at your comments and I engage your comments is because that gives me feedback and helps me to see if you're understanding the issue. My goal as a teacher is to be used of the Holy Spirit to help you understand the scriptures so that you can fall more passion, love with God, stand more in awe of his word and live it out more powerfully by the grace of the Spirit to bring greater glory to Jesus Christ. So that's why I read the comments because that tells me, do you understand? Am I confusing you? Is it making sense? That's the only reason why I'm paying attention to the comments, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't. But it's because I want you to learn this. You with me there? I want you. And yeah, do make sure you hit the like button, man. All right, so we can make this go viral. Viral. I want you to learn this. And I want you to learn it so that you can fall more passionately in love with the triune God and stand more in awe of how real and amazing and mind-blowing our God is. And have no doubt the Bible is his word. But also, you know why I want you to learn this? I want you to learn this so you can teach others. So you can understand it thoroughly and then have the confidence by the grace of God's spirit to teach others. So that more people will be drawn to the God revealed in Jesus and be blown away by his word, the Holy Bible, right? That's the whole purpose. Okay, with me there? Now, with that said, there are two interpretations of Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Now, I may just read Genesis 18 out loud. Instead of having Protestant believer quote it verse by verse, it's going to take too long. And thank God for him serving us. Pray for him and his needs, his provisions, his family. But let me tell you what the two interpretations are. One says, one view says, Jehovah God appeared with two spirit creatures called angels, right? Because when Abraham looked, he saw three men, right? Everyone with me? And this is the 
common interpretation, the most popular interpretation, that in Genesis 18, you have Jehovah God appearing with two spirit creatures, angelic creatures. But then there's another view. Everyone with me there? There's another view. The other view says it's not Jehovah and two angelic creatures, but the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Godhead, the entire Trinity appear on earth in human form as three men. And the reason why two of them are called angels, not because they're creatures, but because they're messengers of the Father. Okay, I'm going to have to break that down. I know those of you who've been following me for years already know this, right? <clears throat> and again, for the sake of those who are just hearing me for the first time or learning this for the first time, bear with me. And it doesn't hurt that we hear things repetitively because we are creatures of repetition. We need to hear things over and over again until by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature, right? Because we are so bombarded by the things of the world, whether work or children, obligations, that we don't spend enough time focusing and meditating on spiritual truths, on the scriptures for it to sink in, right? I don't know why Robin Wright keeps going, ah, what do you have like, a, what do you call it, a crush? Puppy love or something? Aw. Weird. Anyway, it's okay, Robin. I still love you. I don't care what Zena says about you. Okay, now with me there. Every other sentence is aw from the sister. She's like, aw. How cute. You're so cute. All right. Let me explain the word angel. The Hebrew word for angel is malach. Malach. Everyone with me? Make sure you're following along because I want, I want to make sure you get it. Malach. The Hebrew word for angels, malach. The Greek word is angelos. Angelos. In fact, the word angel comes from the Greek angelos. Sound familiar? Angelos. Angelos. Angel. Both in the Hebrew and the Greek, the word for angel simply means messenger. Everyone there? Simply means messenger. That's all it means. Little translation of Malach and Angelos is messenger. So I want you to erase from your mind, I want you to get this out of your mind, a spirit creature with wings. Because when I say angel, first thing comes in your mind, spirit creature with wings. Erase that from your mind. Erase that from your mind. What I want you to start thinking every time you see the word angel is messenger, 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 right? So... As far as the Bible is concerned, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit function as messengers of the Father. What is a messenger? Someone sent to speak on behalf of another. Someone sent to communicate the message of another, right? Since the Father sends the Son to speak on behalf of the Father and to reveal God's word to mankind, that makes Jesus the messenger of the Father. You with me there? The messenger of the Father, i.e. the angel of the Father or the angel of God. Is that clear? Everyone getting this? I hope I'm not boring you because at times I won't be entertaining. I'll be educational by the grace of God. All right. Now, if the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to speak on behalf of the Father and the Son, and to convey and relay the message of the Father and the Son, that means the Holy Spirit is also an angel in that sense, a messenger in that sense. So the Holy Spirit is the angel of the Father and the Son, because an angel is one sent to speak on behalf of another, to represent another, and to communicate the message of another. Right? How you doing, sister? Lord bless you and use you for the glory of Christ. Jenny Martinez, I'm speaking through the sister. The Lord bless all of you and use all of you, right? Is that clear? Now, let me prove to you that the Holy Spirit is an angel in that sense. Let's go to John 16, verses 12 to 13. John 16, verses 12 to 13. Well, Francis Toma, Mormons don't think that Jesus is simply an angel. They think he is Jehovah, and the Holy Spirit is also a God, right? Okay, now... John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, 12 to 13. Okay, let's read. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. 
Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. You see what the Holy Spirit will do? He won't speak on his own initiative. He will only speak what he hears. That's an angel. That's what an angel does. An angel hears the message and then conveys that message on behalf of the one who sends him. Is that clear? You and me there? So the Holy Spirit will only speak what he hears. Hears from who? The Father and the Son. Because the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to speak on their behalf. Well, that's what an angel is. That's what an angel is. An angel is a messenger sent on behalf of another to communicate that one's message to someone. So don't be troubled by the fact that both Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit can be called angels of God. Yeah, one means yes and two means no. Everyone with me there? So is Jesus an angel? Yes, because what is an angel? A messenger, not a creature, a messenger. And if Jesus isn't the angel of the Father, then no one is. Because he is the perfect messenger along with the Holy Spirit. The only two perfect messengers. The only two perfect divine messengers, perfect divine angels that the Father ever sent are the Son and the Holy Spirit. Every other messenger is a creature, limited, finite, and temporal. Clear? So Michael, the archangel, Gabriel, the angel, these are finite, limited, temporal creatures. Finite, limited, temporal messengers of God. Jesus, the Son, the Holy Spirit, are the only two angels sent by the Father who are completely perfect, who are not creatures, but are uncreated, eternal, and infinite. No, France. France, answer your own question. France, I, I know you, brother, you're trying to learn, but sometimes questions do perplex me. How can the father be called an angel when I just said an angel is someone sent to speak on behalf of another? So, Franz Toma, for the love of God, answer me. Who sends the father? And on behalf of who does the father speak? Okay. Franz Toma, who sends the father for the father to be the angel of someone? No, he's asking a sincere question. So, And he's a dear brother. He loves the Lord. So I'm not saying, but I just want you. I don't know what this guy's talking about. So the father sends himself. Well, if he sends himself, then he's not his own messenger. What are you talking about? Wow, you guys really confuse me. So hold on. I'm going to send myself to speak on behalf of myself. So I'm going to call myself the angel of myself. Really? Zina, maybe you're not getting it either, sister. How can he come down as a messenger when messenger means he is speaking a message on behalf of another? I don't think you guys are getting it. But let me just make sure you're getting it. It's okay. Bear with me because I want to make sure you get it. I just explained. That's not I'm beating myself up. I've just explained an angel is a messenger sent to speak on behalf of another. So how can the father come down as an angel when that means he's going to come down to speak on behalf of another to represent another? When he comes down, he doesn't come down on behalf of anyone. With me there? Meaning he doesn't come down. On the authority of anyone, and no one sends him. He does come down, but not as the messenger of someone. Is that clear or no? No, Mega Tank. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the Father's ultimate angels. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So, yes, the Father comes down, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't come down. Because someone sent him 
down to speak on behalf of another in heaven. Do you understand? I'm not saying the Father does not come down. I'm saying he does not come down to be the angel of someone else. You with me there? You understand? See, you see why it takes much more time to go in depth on issues. So you see now why I have to take time. That's why I say, be patient. I can't rush through this because I want you to understand. So let me repeat. The father can come down. No, it's okay, France. You asked an excellent question, brother. God bless you. If it wasn't for your question, then I couldn't clarify it because you see people are confused about that. So you asked an excellent question, brother. Okay. The father can come down and does come down, but he doesn't come down as an angel because if he comes down as an angel, that means someone else in heaven sent him to be the angel of another. Right? Is that clear? So he does come down, but not as an angel. Is it clear or no? Before I move on to give you the evidence. Exactly. Don't be sorry, as Dilla John said. You can ask sincere questions, but bear with me. Okay, now, let me show you the Father does come down, but he doesn't come down as an angel. Because what's the definition of angel? Let me repeat it again. Angel means a messenger sent by another, right, to speak on behalf of another, to convey the message of another, right, and represent another. That's what angel means, right? So if I come to you and convey my message to you, I'm not my own angel because I'm coming to you directly. But if I send first and the last to speak to you on my behalf, then he's now my angel. Reichel, I got your email. God bless you, sister. Is that clear? I believe I, I'm not going to answer your question because to ask me, were they still with the father? How could they not be with the father if they're God, uncreated, eternal by nature? Okay. Let me now show you the father coming down. Matthew 17, verse 5. Michael. I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to send you on your merry way, right? Okay. Folks, did you hear me say that the Father cannot come down without the with without the two other persons being in heaven? Did you hear me even say that? just want to be clear. Hold on, hold on, because I'm going to send Michael on his merry way. Okay. Did you hear me say that the Father comes down, but the Holy Spirit and the Son can't remain in heaven for him to even ask me this question? Okay. Let me repeat again. The father comes down, but that doesn't mean he comes down because someone sent him. The son and the spirit do not send the father. So the son and the spirit can be in heaven and the father come down without this meaning that the son and the spirit sent him. So Michael, brother, this is this is not for you. You got to go, brother. You need to start on milk. So maybe you can go listen to someone else. Sorry, bro. Hold on. God bless you guys. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you're asking me. Can the son send the father or the spirit? Honesty? No. The son does not send the father and the spirit does not send the father. Hold on, let me just make sure we have enough people listening attentively so that the distractions we can get rid of. Hold on. Sorry, guys. You see, sometimes it takes much more time to talk about something, right? It takes more time, right? Okay. I believe, no, the Son does not send the Father. And no, the Holy Spirit does not send the Father because the Son is the Son of the Father which implies that the son is subject to the father and as a son does not send out a father if he is an honorable son the son does not send out his father and since the spirit is the spirit of the father who is also under the authority of the son the spirit does not send the father or the son but he's sent out by both Hold on. 
Okay. Bye bye, Ver. Hold on, man. Let me see. See again. We got to get rid of some people. This is just too much for them. This is not for you guys. But like I said, you guys may be on milk, and this is going to be too much for you guys. So we got to send you on your way. If you're on milk stage, go somewhere else. Really, I'm being honest. Go somewhere else. Okay, hold on. Just want to make sure. Are we ready now? Okay. Hey, first and last, can you post verses? Just want to make sure. Okay. Clear everyone with me so far? Everyone else got it? Exactly. The Father sends... Because that's why you have to ask yourselves the question, why is he called the father? There's a reason. There's a reason why he's called the father, right? And the Bible reveals the reason. Now, sometimes the Bible is silent, doesn't give us the reason, right? Right? But there's a reason why he's called the father and the son is the son, called the son and the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. But anyway, is that clear? Now, let me show you where. The Father can come down, but he's not coming down because some, someone is sending him, right, for the Father to be that someone's angel, angel or messenger. Matthew 17, verse 5. Protestant had something to do. He needed to do something. Okay, Matthew 17, verse 5. Uh, fortitude. Hold on, hold on. Let me send you on your way, buddy. Don't come back, please. I don't need people like you. Honestly, do not come back. Do not come here. Please do yourselves a favor. Don't come here. I don't get it. Why these guys don't understand? Alex, bye-bye, my friend. Bye. Hold on. We're having a field day, man. Hold on. Bye-bye, Alex. Alex, please don't come back. Guys, help me to help you. Don't come back. Okay. Matthew 17, verse 5. While he yet spake... A bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, the Father comes down to bear witness of the Son. Did the Son send him? Did the Holy Spirit send the Father? Or the Father came down to bear witness of the Son, to bear witness to Peter, James, and John, that this is my beloved Son, the Son whom I love. Listen to him. And we know the Holy Spirit did not send the Father down to bear witness of Jesus because the Holy Spirit is with Jesus. Matthew 3, 16, the Spirit came upon him and remained on him, right? So again, let me repeat. I didn't think it was going to be this hard for it to sink in. The Father can't come down, but it's not because he's being sent by someone. So that makes the Father the messenger of that someone, right? But when the Son and the Spirit come down, it's because the Father sends them. Thank you, 1611. Right? Is that clear? Is that clear to everyone? Just want to make sure. I didn't think it was going to take this long for me to unpack this point. I really didn't, but it's okay. If people are asking sincerely, I'll answer. But when I answer, do you want to challenge me and debate me? Then leave, guys. Honestly, listen, I want to repeat it, and I'm getting sick of repeating myself. Because then people say, oh, man, you're impatient. Okay. Hey, we know I'm impatient. Folks, this may not be for you. I want to repeat it one more time. I don't want to repeat it session after session after session. Repeat it one more time. Not every teacher, right, is called to teach everyone. Meaning not everyone will be drawn to a specific teacher. That's why God, in his wisdom, in his love, his mercy, and his power, raises up a plethora of teachers because God will use one teacher to draw one group and another teacher to draw another group because not everyone will gravitate to the same teacher. Is that clear? Is that clear? No, it's not even seminary. No, let me let me let me correct that, Riaz. I'm giving you basic Christian theology 101. But because the church has failed to properly teach Christians their theology, what becomes what was milk a hundred years ago now becomes meat because of the high level of biblical illiteracy. No thanks to these pastors who are not doing their job. Do you know that? You know that, right? 
I'm not teaching seminary stuff, man. I'm not. I'm teaching what Christians are supposed to learn when they come to faith and submit to Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be taught this when you enter into the faith. So what was milk 100 years ago becomes meat because of the illiteracy among Christians to the shame and disgrace of these pastors who are not doing their job. They disgust me. I'll be honest with you. They disgust me. I am disgusted. Okay. I am disgusted with the pastors in America at their utter failure of properly teaching Christians the basics of the Christian faith. It is disgusting. It really is, man. It really is, right? It's disgusting. So that something basic that I'm teaching becomes so difficult to comprehend, not because of the sheep's fault, not your fault. Listen, not because it's your fault. You're the sheep. The fault is with the shepherds. Okay? Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. No, Mega. How can Jesus Holy Spirit come down whenever they want and on their own initiative if the members of the Godhead are inseparably one, perfectly united, and cannot act independently? I taught that the other day. Go back and listen. But here, Hosea 4, verse 6. Read with me. Read with me. Hosea 4, verse 6. And thank first and last. For posting. Read with me, please. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Let me repeat it again. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seest thou has forgotten the law of thy God, I also will also forget thy children. Do you see what it says? You are not a priest to me, you priest. God is condemning the Levitical priests for failing to teach the law properly. And because of that, my people are ignorant of the law and now are perishing because of you priests. You priests, God is damning you because you're failing to teach my people the law and they are now ignorant of the law and perishing because of you priests. And because you forgot the law, I will forget you and your children. You caught it? Hosea 4, verse 6. But are you catching it? No, I'm saying. So I'm not frustrated and angry with you necessarily. I am angry and frustrated at the current state of the church in America and in England. It's become a joke. Folks, the church, not the true spiritual body of Jesus Christ, those born of the Spirit united to Christ. I'm talking about that visible church we see out there. In America, it's become a joke. These pastors are a joke, right? Which is why the world is consuming us and the church is now becoming like the world, conforming to the world to appease the world instead of the church rocking the world and turning the world upside down. Seriously. Right? It's a joke, man. Really, it is. It's disgusting. Okay. Now, let me show you again that the Son and the Spirit do not do things on their own initiative, on their own will, but only do things in perfect union, harmony with one another. Are you ready now? Can I answer that question? Can I now show you that from Scripture, which was the session I did two days ago? Huh? Okay. Are you ready for that? John 5, 19. Let's work through this. Man, it's going to take me much longer than I thought. Okay. Folks, no side discussions. Focus, I'm answering the question. Do the Spirit and the Son come down on their own will? No. No. And where am I getting this from? John 5, 19. Okay, read with me, folks. Read with me, the Lord Jesus speaking. Please pay attention. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. A tank. Mega tank. Did you hear what Jesus said? 
The son can do nothing of himself. Let me repeat it again. The son can do nothing of himself. But what he seeth the father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. Did you catch it? The son. Oh, my goodness. I, I believe you believe in Satan, not in the true God. So get lost. Take a hike. I'm muzzle dogs who use this as an opportunity to attack the Trinity. Now, John 5.30. John 5.30. Oh, here's another black stone kisser. Smooch, smooch, who follows a prophet who raped women, treated them as whores, and he wants to talk about our God. Smooch, smoochy. Smooch the stone. John 5.30. I can of my own self do nothing. I can of my own self do nothing. The demons are manifesting, right? But we're covered by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Spirit. Jesus again, folks, listen, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? I can't do anything on my own initiative. I can of mine own self do nothing. John 8, 28 and 29. John 8, 28, 29. Let's go through this. John 8, 28 to 29. Let's go through this. I don't want chaff here. I want wheat refined by the Holy Spirit. If you're chaff, I'm going to send you on your merry way. John 8, 28, 29. Read with me, folks. Okay. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. Nothing of myself, but as my father hath taught me, I speak these things. Can Jesus be any clearer? And he that sent me is with me. He that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. I do always those things that please him. Okay? John 14, 31. John 14, 31. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. John 12, 49. John 12, 49. John 12, 49. Hit that like button, guys. We have over 100 people. For I have not spoken of myself. Now, Mega Tank, after I answer your question, I'm going to block you. No, it's not talking about the incarnation. The reason why Jesus became incarnate is to obey the Father's will, and it was the Father's will for him to become incarnate. But Mega Tank, after I answer the question, I'm blocking you. So no offense. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Now let me show you why it has nothing to do with Jesus' incarnation. Because Mega Tank, if you're pretending to be listening, I quoted John 16, 13. But Mega Tank, now I'm going to show you. He says the same thing about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit did not become flesh. Did not become flesh. So you can't pass it off as incarnation. And when you read it, you're gone. You're not coming back. John 16, 13. Let's read it. John 16, 13. Okay. John 16, 13. Another guy who's a know-it-all, Mega Tank. Because he's not listening. He's pretending he wants answers. First and last, before the rapture, brother. Okay. G Mega tank. He says the same thing of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit did not become flesh. So much for your claim. Isn't this the incarnate son? Okay. Here. Read, Mega tank. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Now, can I ask you guys a question? Does this mean the Holy Spirit became incarnate, became flesh? Because like Jesus, he doesn't speak on his own initiative. He only speaks what he hears. So now why would Mega Tank tell me? Why would Mega Tank tell me? Isn't this the incarnate son speaking? It's Jesus as a man speaking? No. 
The reason why Jesus became incarnate is because he only does what the Father commands. And it was the Father's will that he become incarnate. But what do you say about the Holy Spirit, Mega Tank? When Jesus says the same thing about the Holy Spirit, he will not speak on his own initiative. He'll only speak what he hears. Does that mean, per your logic, the Holy Spirit also became incarnate? Mega Tank? Bad theology, man. Wow. What's your answer to the Holy Spirit only speaking what he hears and not speaking on his own initiative? Are you going to brush that aside as the Holy Spirit becoming flesh too? So why are you telling me that Jesus is speaking because of the incarnation? When it's Jesus as the Son who only does what the Father tells him to do and obeys the Father's will perfectly, which included the Son becoming incarnate. Exactly, Riaz. You got it. So Mega Tank, convince me that you really are open to learn and you're not argumentative. So I don't send you on America because this is too much for you to handle. Oh, no, help me. Help, help me to help you. Zina, you again created a false dichotomy. Yeah, Zina. Yeah, Zina. I thought I went through this the other day with you. Yeah, Khati. I think I'm going to end up stop teaching after today, man. I can't do this, honestly. I'm going to have to stop, seriously. Zina. Why would you ask me this question when two days ago we answered this? What do you mean the Holy Spirit is equal to Jesus or hierarchy? Why do you assume it's either or? So let me turn it against you. Zena, is your brother equal to you, your oldest brother? Or is there a hierarchy where you're subject to him? So is he equal to you? Or is there a hierarchy so that he's greater than you and better than you? So you're the older one, choose? I didn't know you're the older one. You're the 42-year-old? I didn't know which one she was talking about. So you're the 42-year-old? Okay, 37. All right. Let's go with the 42-year-old. Okay, the 42-year-old, is he... Are you equal to him or is there a hierarchy, Zina? I went through this two sessions ago. First and last, bad choice of topic, brother. You asked me to talk about the Trinity, Genesis 18. It's already about an hour and I haven't even gotten into the topic, bro. You see the drama you caused me? No, no, no. We are going to mind, Zina. No, 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 no. You're going to answer my question, Zina. Is your 42-year-old brother? No, 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 no. Where you're going to answer the question, Zina. Is your 42-year-old brother, are you equal to him or is there a hierarchy? No, honestly, man. No, Zina, there's a hierarchy because as the firstborn, you are subject to him. So he can't be equal to you. See what you just did? You again assume that if he's equal to you in one way, then there can't be a hierarchy in another way. Why do you keep making that mistake? Why? I don't get it. As the firstborn, he is over you, whether you like it or not. According to God, the firstborn, no, you don't have to be stupid. You just got to listen. It's not about being stupid, Zina. It's about listening. As the firstborn in your family, he is head over you. He is your head, whether you like it or not. So there is a hierarchy. But does that mean you are not equal to him in another way? Why do we make the mistake as Christians in assuming that if we're equal, there can't be a hierarchy? Why do we assume that? Now, I just want to know, why do we assume that? She'll get it. Okay. So let me ask you the question. Is your brother, are you equal to your firstborn brother or is there a hierarchy? What's the answer? What's the answer? What's the answer? Zina. 
Are you equal to your brother or is there a hierarchy? So then you're not equal to your brother, so you're not human, Zina. Then what are you, a cat? So that means he's better than you in value, in essence, in nature. Really, Zina? Audhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Bismillah rahman rahim Okay. Zina, are you equal to him or is there a hierarchy? Meow, 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 meow. So Zina, so he's equal to you and there's not a hierarchy. Are you serious? So as the firstborn, he doesn't have authority over you? So let's try it again, Zina. Is he equal to you? Are you equal to him or is there a hierarchy? Zina, answer the question, sister. Don't help her out. Yes, Zina. Allah Akbar! Yes, it's both. Allah Akbar! So why do you keep assuming if you're equal, there can't be a hierarchy. If there's a hierarchy, you can't be equal. So when you ask me the question, is the Holy Spirit equal to Christ or is there a hierarchy? That's a false dichotomy. Why can't it be both? That the Holy Spirit is equal to Jesus in essence, in glory, in nature, in value, but still subject to the Son. You see how you set up the question? You set up a false dichotomy. Yeah, actually, you know what's ironic? I'm in a Christian center. It's a new center. And the neighbors upstairs, they're Muslims, and the owner of the building is Muslim. So I'm going to get myself in trouble. You know that, right? Honestly, I will. I'm not lying because they can hear me. They hear me. They're going to think these Christians are mocking Islam. So I'm going to probably get the pastor, the owner of this place, killed. Okay. Zina, to answer your question, the Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son in essence, in nature, in glory. In value, in power, in honor, in majesty. But he's subject to the Father and the Son. He's subject to the Father and the Son. Meaning the Father and the Son have authority over the Spirit, which is why the Father and the Son can send the Spirit. And the Spirit is sent by both of them to speak on their behalf. You got it now, Zina? But now let me prove that to you. That the Father and the Son... Send out the Holy Spirit because Father and the Son have authority over the Spirit, but the Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son in essence, nature, glory, majesty, power, and honor. Just like you are equal to your firstborn brother in essence, you're both fully human in the eyes of God. You have the same value and dignity and worth, but he still has authority over you because he's the firstborn. I'm using an analogy from creation to give an idea of how it works even within the Godhead. Is that clear? Is that clear? I just want to make sure you got it. I want to make sure she got it. Zena, did you hear that? Did you get that part, what I just said? Okay, now let me show you the Father and the Son have authority over the Spirit and can send the Holy Spirit to speak on their behalf. Okay, let me show you that. John 15, 26. John 15, 26. Guys, honestly, pray for me. John 15, 26. I'll tell you after this. Pay attention now. Read the passages with me. But when the comfort has come, whom I... Jesus speaking, I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So Zena, everyone else, pay attention. Jesus says, I will personally send the Spirit of truth, the Comforter, from the Father, who goes out from the Father. I'm sending him. Do you see the Son has authority to send the Holy Spirit?
Do you see that? I want everyone, did you catch it? Okay. But then we read, the Father sends the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26. I'm really disgusted with the current state of the church in America, as well as in Europe. Basics of the faith and we don't learn. It disgusts me. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Ah, so now the Father sends the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, on behalf of Christ, for the sake of Christ, you know, in the name of Christ. So Father and Son, Father and Son, send the Holy Spirit for the sake of Christ, on behalf of Christ, to speak in the place of Christ. Do you see it? He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you, right? John 16, 7. 16, 7, let's read it. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Did you guys catch it? Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name. I will send the Holy Spirit from the Father, because he proceeds from the Father. I will send him to you. Father and Son together sent the Holy Spirit, showing that the Father and Son have authority over the Spirit. So then in John 16, 13, notice what our Lord says here. John 16, 13. I don't even think I'm going to get into the Trinity in the Old Testament. Man, dude. John 16, 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So, guys, let me ask you a question. Jesus just said that when the Holy Spirit comes, the Spirit of truth, he won't speak on his own initiative. He'll only speak to you what he hears. In the context, in John 16, 7, Jesus says, I will send him to you. John 15, 26, I will send him to you from the Father because he goes out from the Father. John 14, 26, the Father will send the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. So now here's my question to every one of you. Since Father and Son are sending the Spirit from the Father's presence on behalf of the Son, by the authority of the Son, to speak in the place of the Son, who is the Holy Spirit hearing from when He then communicates to the apostles, teaches them all things, and reminds them of the things that Jesus said to them? Who is He hearing from? And who is He relaying the message for no debating guys stop fighting one another focus france toma andrew martin don't get into side discussions focus who is he hearing from who is he speaking on behalf of it's going to hurt me if you guys tell me father if you guys tell me son, that means you're not listening. Thank you. If I just said the father sends the son, I'm sorry, the father sends Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, and the son sends the spirit from the father, so father and son together send the spirit, then why are you going to tell me, oh, the father, he speaks on behalf of the father. Oh, he speaks on behalf of the son. Both. So most of you got it. Both. He hears from the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son together tell the Spirit what to say. So he is relaying what both of them are telling the Spirit to say. I'm going to have to change the title of this message. Because I don't even think I'm going to get into Genesis 18. It's been all, almost, it's been over an hour. Right? 
Sorry, guys. I know I sound like a broken record. I don't mean to offend you guys, but it really hurts my heart. It really hurts my heart to see the state of the church today, that these pastors were supposed to be shepherds and are not feeding the flock. Right? It's sad, man. What was milk 100 years ago, milk 100 years ago, now has become meat. Milk has become meat because churches have become a joke and they become disgusting. It's sickening, man. It really it sickens me. It hurts me. It angers me for you guys, honestly. It hurts me and angers me for you guys. Honestly, it really does. I really get hurt for you guys. Okay. What's slow, Michelle? That hasn't even begun in churches. Here, I'm going to prove it to you. Okay, here, I'm going to prove it to you. When's the last time you guys who go to churches, when's the last time you heard a sermon on the biblical basis for the Trinity? When's the last time? Anyone? Okay. When's the last time you heard a sermon on the Holy Spirit being a divine person from the Holy Bible? Proving from the Holy Bible the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Claudia Martinez, you are rare. And even when you say last Sunday, is it one sermon or is it a series of teachings where you go in depth or just one sermon in passing? Don't give me one sermon. I'm talking about a series. Okay. When's the last time you heard the church go in depth on the biblical basis for Jesus being God and man and what that means? Okay. Susan Baker. Maybe I wasn't clear. I'm not talking about one sermon, 40 minutes in passing. A series of in-depth discussion on the biblical foundation for these doctrines. Series. Okay, Claudia, I'm going to make it easy for you to understand my question. The Sunday before that. The Sunday before that. The Sunday before that. Now here, I want to hear something else from you guys. When was the last time you heard a series on the biblical doctrine of hell? When's the last time? An in-depth series on hell? Jonathan, you're unique. All right. You understand this nature of the church today? You see what's going on? Right? And these are the core doctrines of the faith. Here. Hebrews 5, 14 and 15. Let's read Hebrews 5, 14 and 15. So... If you preach on hell, then you're not an affirming church, even though the Bible has a lot to say about hell. You make perfect sense, dude. I'm about to block you for that comment. Hebrews 5, not 14, 12 to 14, first and last. You know I'm angry right now. I'm going to punish you. Take my anger out on you. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Read with me, folks. Actually, Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. I'm sorry. Let's start at verse 11. Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. Read with me, folks. Let me show you what the basics are. Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. Read with me and watch the basics. Of whom we have many things to say. I want to say a lot of things that are in depth. That's what Paul is saying. And hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Notice what Paul is saying to these Christians, these Jewish Christians. I want to say these things, but they're hard for you to accept, and you're dull of hearing. Why? Guys, read 12 to 14, folks. Please read with me. For when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. It is time for you guys to be teachers. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. He's now rebuking them, right? And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. 
If you're still on milk stage, you're not skillful in knowing how to handle the word of God because you're a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Guys, go back and read Hebrews 5, 11, 14. You know what Paul is saying? He's rebuking these Jewish Christians saying, I want to talk about advanced theology, but you're dull of hearing because you can't understand them. Though you should have been teachers by now, you're still babes on milk stage. Why? He's rebuking them. Did you know that? Did you catch it? You listening to what Paul just said? There are things I want to teach you, advanced theology, but you can't accept them. They're too hard for you because you're dull of hearing, because you're still on milk stage, even though you're supposed to be teachers by now. 12 years you've been in the faith and you're still on milk stage. 12 years you've been in the faith and you can't understand advanced theology. I got to go back on milk stage, teach you the first principles the basics of the faith. What is happening to you guys? Why are you on milk stage? See, he's rebuking them, isn't he? Hebrews 5, 11 and 14. You caught it? He's rebuking these Jewish Christians, these Jewish followers of Jesus, saying, all these years you've been in the faith professing to be a Christian, and you're still on milk stage for the love of Christ? You're not teachers yet? You guys should have been teachers already. Here, let me show it to you. Hebrews 5.12. Hebrews 5.12. I don't even know what to title this anymore. I can't title Trinity Theophanies. I didn't even get into it. Hebrews 5.12. One more time. I don't know what to title it, honestly. Hebrews 5.12. Protestant is back. For when for the time you ought to be teachers. See, it's the time now for you to be teachers. L guys, read it. Time now for you to be teachers. You have need, you still have need that one should teach you again, which is the first principles of the oracles of God. My goodness, Christians, the time has come for you to be teachers, but you still need someone to teach you the basics of the word of God. Right? See what he's saying here? Right? It's tiring, man. Right. Everyone with me there? You caught it? Now let me show you the basics that every one of you that came into the faith had to be taught in and assured of. Now, that's what the church was supposed to do when you got saved. Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 2. Okay, I will do that, Glenn, 1989. I think that's a, that's a good title. Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 2. Sad, man. It really is. Tiring, too. Sorry. Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 2. I hope you still were blessed, challenged, and out of my love for you, rebuking you in love to shake you up, shake you up. Now here, Hebrews 6, 1 to 2. Folks, here are the basics of your faith. Guys, here are the basics of your faith. Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, when he means the basics of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection, meaning let's now become spiritual mature. Let's stop being babes. Let's become grown men and women spiritually. Not laying again the foundation. Now notice the basics of your faith. He mentions it here. Guys, the basics of your faith. faith. Here's what the basics, what you're supposed to be taught. Repenting from dead works, dead works, works that are dead don't save you. You're supposed to be taught what it what dead works are and to repent of it and faith toward God. You're supposed to be taught the doctrine of baptisms. Notice more than one baptism. Baptisms. You're supposed to be taught the value of laying of hands. Why do you lay hands? What's the purpose of laying hands? And when do you lay hands? And you're supposed to be taught the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Man! How many of you have been taught those basics? Do you see what the basics of your faith are? Repenting from dead works. Works that are dead, that don't save you. Faith towards God, right? Baptisms. Laying of hands. The resurrection of the dead. And eternal judgment. 
Those are the milk of your faith. Those are the milk of your faith. When's the last time you were taught the resurrection of the dead? What's the resurrection of the dead? Why the resurrection of the dead? When the resurrection of the dead? Eternal judgment. Laying of hands. Why do you lay hands? When do you lay hands? For what purpose do you lay hands? Repenting, turning away from dead works and faith towards God. And when was the last time you were told, it's not just one baptism, there are various baptisms. Baptisms. And Paul says, that's the basic milk stage of your faith. And guys, can you honestly tell me, when was the last time you were taught these basics? Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 2. Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 2. Exactly. Y-N-M-2-J. You got it. Y-N-M-2-J. You got it. See? Now, Nate's asking me, why do you lay hands? You got 66 books of the Bible, if you're Protestant, that tells you when they laid hands, why they laid hands, for what purpose. Did you know that? 66 books. And in those books, you're going to find various situations Various circumstances where people laid hands for various reasons. In fact, I'll give you one in Acts 8. Acts 8. Are you ready for one example? Acts 8. Are you ready? An atheist who is a closet Christian who's falling in love with Jesus and is coming back to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit is telling you, Christians, read your New Testament. Andrew Mark. Okay. And Acts 8. Guys. Acts 8, it says, Philip, the evangelist, went to a certain Samaritan village, did signs and wonders, preached the gospel. They believed the gospel, got baptized in water, but still did not receive the Holy Spirit until Peter and John came down. And it says, they laid hands on them and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there, the apostles laid their hands to transmit the gift of the Holy Spirit. You caught it? You caught it? Okay. Let's go to 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. Let's read 17 to 19. 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 19. And you lay hands to heal people is all, yeah. First Timothy 5, 17, 19. Are you ready? As Holy Spirit enables to recall scriptures for the glory of Christ. First Timothy 5, 17 to 19. Zena, you got it now so far? You're learning to? Okay, read with me, guys. Read. Please read this. It's about elders. Elders. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And I'll quote the verse after. Quote it. Don't easily entertain accusation against an elder. Right? And then see what Paul says. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Keep going. Keep going. Watch here. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So I must have skipped something. Hold on. Okay, there must be. Mm. Okay, hold on, hold on. Sorry, guys. See, sometimes I got a computer shut down myself. Oh boy, I'm stressing myself out. Sorry about that. Either it's because I'm reacquainting myself with the King James Bible, and this is why. Hold on, let me see something. Yep. Okay. Sorry, guys. See, sometimes because I'm reacquainting myself with the King James Bible, 
I memorize passages from certain scriptures in the King James. That's why I'm going to now reacquaint myself with the King James Bible. First Timothy 4.14. Sorry about that. But anyway, First Timothy 4.14. Interesting. First Timothy 4.14. Interesting, isn't it? That's why I'm starting to read the King James Bible again. Hopefully, I will memorize that. And I'm sticking with it till the Lord takes me home. Okay. Notice 1 Timothy 4.14. Here's another occasion of laying hands. Guys, 1 Timothy 4.14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Did you catch it? 1 Timothy 4.14. Paul is saying the gift of the Holy Spirit that's fanned in you was fanned in you when elders laid hands on you. See? The Spirit gave you a gift. The elders then blessed you and fanned that gift in you when they laid hands on you. 1 Timothy 4.14. So are you seeing different occasions in which hands were laid for various purposes? Do you see that there? In Acts 8, Peter and John laid hands so they could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit of life. Here, Timothy had elders lay hands to confirm the gift the Spirit gave him and to fan the, the flame of that gift, to put him on fire to use that gift for the glory of Christ. You see it? Are you, are you catching it there? Who would have thought that learning the reason why we lay hands, when to lay hands, for what purpose, is part of the basics of the Christian faith. Who would have thought that? Would you have thought that? Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2. And when's the last time you had someone teaching you the purpose of laying of hands? And who would have thought that part of the basic, the milk stage of a believer is to learn about the various baptisms. There's not one baptism, folks. There are different baptisms that were appointed for different reasons on different occasions. There's no controversy as far as the Bible's concerned, Cindy. Are you with me there? So now be honest with me, guys. I want to hear it again. When's the last time your church taught you the milk of your faith, the basic principles, the basic doctrine of faith, which is, here they are, which are not his, baptisms. When's the last time your church taught you the different baptisms mentioned in Scripture and their purposes? When's the last time your church taught you the doctrine of laying of hands, why we lay hands, when do we lay hands, and for what purpose? When's the last time? When's the last time your church taught you thoroughly, systematically, the resurrection of the dead? Why the resurrection of the dead? When the resurrection of the dead? And eternal judgment. When's the last time your church systematically taught you turning away from dead works, works that are dead, that are of no avail, and turning to God in faith. And what does that entail? Okay. Most of you could, couldn't answer and tell me, oh, this. Okay, so that's my point. Notice it took me no, almost an hour and a half to explain a basic doctrine of the Trinity. And what is the Trinity? One God, three persons. I'm not saying you're going to fully comprehend the Trinity. That's beyond comprehension. But at least see what the Bible says about the Trinity. That even a child can see, oh, Father is God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God. Father is Holy Spirit. They love one another. They relate to one another, so they're not the same relationship. And it's one God. Though I may not fully comprehend it, oh, I see that's what the Bible teaches. You see, you get what I'm saying? I'm not saying to have full comprehension that's beyond our ability i'm saying at least seeing oh, oh okay the bible teaches that yeah it's a little confusing i don't fully get it but yeah okay i see 
and then teaching us to distinguish between hierarchy and equality, meaning you can be equal in one way, but still be subject. In, in other words, you can be equal in one way to someone and then subject to that someone in another sense. Equal in one sense, but subject in another sense. And that's all around us, right? Choose Jesus and Zina. Are you still here? Right? Are you getting it? Right? We are surrounded with this all day, all night, Zina and Choose and everyone else. This hierarchy that in one sense we're not equal, but in another sense we are. And I will go down the list. Bosses and employees. Bosses are head over the employees. But the employees are equal to their bosses in dignity and value and essence and worth. That's one. Parents and children. Parents are head over their children. Parents have authority over their children. Children are subject to parents, but they're equal in essence, in nature, in value, in glory, in honor. Even in the created realm, in the created order, we see how things can be equal in one sense, but then. There's an inequality in another sense, and that's part of creation. So why should it shock us that when it comes to the eternal God, who exists as three persons, that these three persons can be equal in essence, in glory, in nature, in honor, in value, but still be a hierarchy of authority among themselves? Right? So going back to the question, is the Holy Spirit equal to the Son or is there a hierarchy? Who said it's either or? It's both and. He's equal to the Son in essence, in glory, in majesty, in power, in honor, but subject to the Son in authority. Right? Now let me show you that from Jesus Christ, the God-man. That Jesus, the God-man, is equal to the Father in essence, in nature, in glory, in value and honor, but subject to him as the Son and also as a human being. I'm going to show you where the Bible uses the same Greek word, hupotasso, hupotasso, in reference to Jesus being subject to the Father and subject to Mary, his blessed mother, and Joseph, his legal father. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? The same Greek word, hupotasso, is used in reference to Jesus being subject to the Father as the divine Son and as a human being and subject to his earthly parents, his biological mother, and his legal father, without this implying that he's inferior in value to either group. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Yeah, I'm going to have to change the title, man. Change the title. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And this is one that anti-Trinitarians use to refute the Trinity because it shows their ignorance, which is why you can't be ignorant. The fallen world thinks that if I'm subject to someone, that makes that someone better than me. That's the fallen world. God says, no, just because you're subject to someone doesn't make that someone better than you. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Read with me. The Son will be subject to God the Father. Read. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Read with me. Tony Pino, I love you, brother. It's not time to pontificate, but to learn and listen, bro. Honestly. Because when you keep texting and commenting, you're confusing me. Listen and learn, my brother. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, the Son, then shall... The Son also himself be subject unto him, God the Father. The Son will be subject, same Greek word is going to be used elsewhere, subject unto him, God the Father, that put all things under the Son, him, that God may be all in all. Now, guys, see what this passage said. The Son will be subject to God the Father. The Greek word is hupotasso. Hupotasso. Subject to God the Father. You with me there? Okay. Now, let's see how this same word is used elsewhere. Luke 2, 51. Luke chapter 2, verse 51. 
Luke 2, chapter 2, verse 51. Luke 2, verse 51. Man, we got to get over 200, but the way I'm going, I'm going to lose everyone because I keep blocking people. Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Read with me. Same Greek word, Zena and everyone else. And he went down with them. Jesus went down with his biological mother, his blessed mother, and legal father, Joseph, came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Bam! Same Greek word. Jesus was subject to Mary, his mother, and to his legal father. Same Greek word, but his mother kept all these things saying in their heart. Now, does that mean Mary and Joseph were better in essence, in nature, in value, in dignity than Jesus, their son? Buffering, sorry, it was buffering. You and me there? Zena, did you see it? Zena, did you see it? it? says Jesus the Son was subject to his blessed mother and his legal father. He was subject to them. You saw it? You can see Greek or English or Swahili. It's the same thing. Okay. You saw it? All right. So should I assume, should I assume, Okay, with me there listening? Should I assume Mary is better than Jesus? She's of superior value and dignity and worth than Jesus. And same thing with Joseph because Jesus is subject to Mary and Joseph. Should I assume that? So why should I assume that Jesus is inferior to the Father in essence and nature and glory and value because he's subject to the Father? In fact, here's what's ironic. Guys, listen to every, listen to this, and I want Zena, I want her to learn this. In one sense, Jesus is not just equal to Mary and Joseph. He's infinitely better than them because he's God. So notice, here is God in the flesh, subject to mere human creatures, whereas Jesus was more than a man. He was their God and creator, and yet their God and creator subjected himself to them. Wow. Did you catch it? So not only is Jesus equal to Mary and Joseph, in essence, nature, glory, and value, because he's just as much human as they are. In another sense, he's infinitely better than them, infinitely greater than them. Right? Infinitely, because unlike them, he's God Almighty who created them and gives them life and sustains them that became flesh. Likewise, Jesus is subject to the Father because he's the God-man. As God, he's the divine Son, and as the Son, he's subject to the Father, but equal to the Father in essence, nature, glory, value, and honor. But he's also man, and by virtue of his human nature, he's inferior to the Father in that nature. Clear? Not three natures, dude. Two natures. Don't add a third one. Clear? So, are you understanding that Jesus can be subject to the Father in one way, but equal to the Father in another way? Just like he was subject to Mary and Joseph in one sense, but equal to them in another sense, and then infinitely better than them in another sense. Right? Similarly, the Holy Spirit can be subject to the Father and the Son in one sense, but equal to the Father and Son in another sense. So never ask me, and I'm saying this generally, never ask me, is the Son and the Holy Spirit equal to the Father, or is there a hierarchy? Why that false dichotomy? Why either or? No, both and. Son and Spirit equal to the Father in essence, nature, glory, value, dignity. But also there's a hierarchy in that the Son and the Spirit are subject to the Father. 
And in respect to the son, the son is not just God, but he also took on human nature, a nature that's created and temporal and infinitely less than the divine nature. So in respect to his human nature, he is less than the father. Who's fully man, but only a man. I don't get what you're talking about. You guys are all over the man. Okay. Is that clear? If there's someone confused, put a two, because I'm going to show you that the Holy Spirit, equal to the Father and the Son, is subject to the Father and the Son. I'm just going to talk about the Son being subject to the Father and the Son. And I gave you Luke 2.51, where it says, The Son, Jesus Christ, subjected himself to Mary and Joseph, just like the Son of God will subject himself to God the Father. Luke 2.51, 1 Corinthians 15.28. No, Jonathan and Ray. I'm not even going to touch Genesis 18. It's already an hour and a half. You want me to spend another two hours? Exactly, Andrew Martin. Okay, now I'm going to end it by talking about the Holy Spirit being subject to the Father and the Son. Father and Son have authority over this Holy Spirit. Father and Son can send out the Holy Spirit. Father and Son can command the Holy Spirit. And the Father can send out the Son and command the Son. But one thing you won't find in Scripture, one thing you won't find in Scripture is the Son or the Spirit commanding, sending the Father to do something on their behalf. You'll never find in Scripture the Son and the Spirit sending the Father to do something on their behalf. Did you know that? Is that clear? You got it or no? Son and the Spirit. You'll never find in Scripture Son and Spirit sending the Father to do something on their behalf. You'll always find God the Father sending the Son and the Spirit and or the Son sending the Spirit, but you won't find the Son and the Spirit sending the Father to do something on their behalf. It does not appear in Scripture. This is why historically the early church has always taught the Father is the head of the Godhead. The Son is second, and the Spirit is third. Why do you think we say first person the Father, second person the Son, third person the Holy Spirit? Why do you think we say that? Where do you think we got it from? We got it from what the Bible teaches, how they relate to one another, how they are ordered, and how they command one another. Clear? Clear? Now, I already showed you from John, right? I already showed you from John. The Father sends Jesus in the name of Jesus. Jesus sends the Father. I'm sorry. The Father Spirit. Jesus sends the Father Spirit, the Spirit of the Father, from the Father. So Father and Son together send the Spirit, right? I already showed you that from John. Tony Pino, you know you're going to get blocked, right? That is a lie. Many have seen the Father, Yah. Stop pontificating and sharing your error when I've corrected that mistake over and over again. Stop coming here and preaching. Many have seen the Father, Yah. Admins, do your job. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Okay. Let me show you now the Father and the Son. Sending the Spirit, pouring out the Spirit, having authority over the Spirit, which is why, by the way, folks, which is why the Spirit is said to be not just the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is said to be not just the Spirit of God the Father, but the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Son. Did you know that? Are you guys with me there? No, not so much a video K question. Do you know that? The, the scriptures teach the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father and the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Son, because the Father and the Son have authority over the Spirit, and the Spirit belongs to both of them equally. Do you know that? But here's what you won't find. 
Jesus Christ said to be the son of the Holy Spirit. He's the son of the Father, and the Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father and the Spirit of Jesus Christ the Son, because Father and Son have authority over the Spirit. Can I show you that now? Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. Let me show you that. Not in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, we don't have a reference to the Spirit of the Son. Okay. Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. Let's go. Let's do this. R read with me. Romans 8, verse 9 to 10. Man, this really tired me out. I didn't think it was going to be this intense. Read with me, folks. But ye are not in the flesh. Guys, let's see if you catch it. Ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, in union with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So here, God means God the Father. The Spirit of God dwells in you. But now notice the next line. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, I'm confused. Is it the Spirit of God in me or the Spirit of Christ? But then 10 confuses me more. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life. The Spirit makes you alive because of righteousness. Okay, now I'm confused. Is it the Spirit of God in me, or is it the Spirit of Christ in me, or is it Christ in me? Did you read it? Spirit of God is in you. Spirit of Christ is in you. And if the Spirit of Christ is in you, then Christ is in you. Because the Spirit mediates the presence of the Father and Son to us. He's the one who connects us to the Father and the Son. So if you have the Spirit, then you have the Father and the Son, because you're connected to the Father and Son because of the Spirit. Wow. What's up, man? But guys, whose Spirit is it? Is it the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ? Now, Jenny, why the question mark? Is it the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ? What's the answer? Romans 8, 9. Spirit of God in you, Spirit of Christ. What's the answer? Both. It's the Spirit of God. Who is the Spirit of Christ? But why is he the Spirit of Christ? Because like God, Christ has authority over the Spirit. And the Spirit is subject to Christ as he's subject to God. Are you seeing it? You getting it or no? So I can move on to the next examples. God bless you too, Mighty Mouse. Romans 8, 14 to 16. Romans 8, 14 to 16. Hope you're being blessed, Al. You're not leaving it, are you? Chan, I, brother, you're asking a question that has nothing to do with the topic, and I don't have time to go into another topic. Sorry. No, because his human nature has nothing to do with the fact, Linky, that he's still God, one with the Father in essence. Okay, now Romans 8, 14 to 16. Read with me. Romans 8, 14 to 16. For as many are led by the Spirit of God. Now it's the Spirit of God the Father. They are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Notice, the Spirit of God the Father in me moves me to cry out to God, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God the Father is in me, uniting me to God, and giving me the authority to say to God, you are my Abba, my Father. Whose spirit? The spirit of God the Father. That now united me to God, making God my Father. Did you catch it? So let me ask again. Whose spirit is in me that gives me the right to call God Abba, Father? In this passage. Whose spirit? Read it again. Whose spirit? Linky, just because Christ is below the Father in authority because of his human nature doesn't make him below the Holy Spirit because of his human nature because Jesus didn't become man to be subject to the Spirit. He became man to be subject to the Father. Stop confusing the categories. And Jesus is also below the Father in authority by virtue of being the Son. No, Chan, you're not paying attention, Chan. You're not paying attention, Chan. Romans 8, 14, 15, Chan. 
Nope, you guys are not paying attention. Romans 8, 14, 15, whose spirit in me gives me the right to cry out to God, Abba, Father? No, Glenn, not in this particular context. This is why I said Romans 8, 14 and 15. Do you guys even listen? Jonathan, let me repeat it again. Not according to Romans 8, 14 and 15. It's not both. Please pay attention. Jonathan, my brother. Hold on. I love you, Jonathan. Bye-bye, my brother. Romans 8, 14 and 15. Glenn, please, brother. I'm, I'm trigger happy. I don't want to block you either, sir. Romans 8, 14, 15. Let's post it again. Abraham, do not repeat the same error I just corrected. I'm trigger happy. I'm going to send people on Blockville. Let me repeat for the 10th time. Romans 8, 14 to 15. Post it again. If you guys don't get it, I'm going to retire from teaching. Romans 8, 14 to 15. Whose spirit in me? Bye-bye, JJ. Whose spirit in you gives you the right to call God Abba? Whose spirit? Read 8, 14 and 15. Whose spirit? Whose Holy Spirit, Chan? Most of you got it. I'm proud of you guys. I want to see if everyone else is going to get it. Yay! Spirit of God, meaning God the Father. So in Romans 8, 14 and 15, it's the Spirit of God, meaning the Father, that gives me the right to call him Father, right? So here, it's the Spirit of God. Who's God? The Father. Clear? Clear? So let's look at Romans 8, 14 and 15. This took much longer than I would have wanted it to take. Either that means I suck as a teacher or, man, I got to do a lot of explaining and a lot of groundwork because of the level of biblical illiteracy in churches. No thanks to pastors who are not doing their job. Either I suck as a teacher or the state of the church in America has become pitiful. Romans 8, 14 and 15. It's one of the two or both. Let's read again. Let's read again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Let me repeat again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, anytime you see the word God, without qualification, it means the Father. Anytime the word God appears and there's nothing in the context to show otherwise, God always means the Father. The Spirit of God, the Father, that's the Spirit of the adoption, that makes me cry out, Abba, Father, right? We got it? We got it? Please tell me we got it, man. Please. I am fried right now. So it's the Spirit of God the Father that gives us the right to say, Abba, Father. All right. This is why I took 20 minutes on this point, because now I want to show you Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Zena, are you listening? Choose. Are you guys there? You're like silent. Zena got scared. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Galatians 4, verse 6. Galatians 4, verse 6. Watch here. Okay, but are you getting it, Zena? Please let me know you're getting it. Now notice what Paul does. The same Paul who wrote Romans 8, wrote Galatians 4, 6. Notice what he says here. And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Whoa, Paul, what are you doing in my brain? Paul, Romans 8, you said it's the spirit of God the Father. That's the spirit of adoption that makes me say, Abba, Father. But whoa, Paul, in Galatians 4, 6, you're saying now it's the spirit of the son that makes me cry out, Abba, Father. Paul, whose spirit is it? That makes me cry out, Abba, Father. Paul, I can't handle this. My brain is too small, Paul. 
Do you see why I spent 20 minutes for you to get the point that in Romans 8, 14 and 15, it's Spirit, God the Father? So you see how amazing Paul is that in Galatians 4, 6, what was the Spirit of God, the Father, that made me cry out, Abba, Father, now becomes the Spirit of His Son. Notice there are three. The Spirit of His Son. Spirit, His Son. Spirit, Father, Son. Three. Now let's look at Galatians 4, 4 to 6. Galatians 4, 4 to 6. I know King of Kings. I know. Galatians 4, 4 to 6. Let's read it again. Yes, that's good, your book says it. But in, Galatians, in Romans 8, 14 to 15, Marion, it's the Spirit of God the Father. Guys, let's read Galatians 4, 4 to 6. Count. Tell me how many. Count. Count with me. Galatians 4, 4 to 6. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Notice what I said. Whenever you see the word God, and there's nothing in the context to show otherwise, God will always mean the father. And here's proof. God sent forth his son. That means that's God the father. Made of a woman, made under the law. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of, of sons. Now notice verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our crying, Abba, Father. God, his son, and the spirit of his son. That's three. God, his son, the spirit of his son. So the spirit of his son is the spirit of God in Romans 8, 14. What was the spirit of God the Father in Romans 8, 14? Is now the spirit of God's Son. Is it sinking in? Do you see why we are Trinitarians? It's not of the same spirit, Jojo Monster. The Holy Spirit belongs to the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is subject to the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is perfectly obedient to the Father and the Son. I'm giving you a couple of seconds for it to sink in. Shenabi, let me change the topic on the Trinity. And the Father and Son, how they read, Father and Son, Holy Spirit relate to one another and talk about Tawheed. Yeah. After spending an hour and a half, let me talk about Tawheed. Okay. Okay. Is it sinking in? Al, is this blessing you and blowing your mind away? Zena, choose. How about you guys? Andrew, yeah, just don't entertain side discussions. Let's just focus on this. Okay. So are you seeing from Scripture there's a hierarchy? Father is head of the Son and the Spirit. Son and the Spirit are subject to the Father. The Son is head of the Spirit. The Spirit is subject to the Son. But all three persons are fully God, eternally God, equal in essence, nature, glory, value, dignity, and honor. Because they're one God. Do you see why we're Trinitarians? The Bible forces us to the Trinity. Okay. Philippians 1.19. Brother, write a book. I'm fried teaching. And there are times in which I even think about stopping teaching and finding a secular job that pays well so I can disappear. But hold on. Just let's focus on this. Philippians 1.19. Philippians 1.19. Good medic for Christ. God bless you. You're getting it. Philippians 1.19, guys, read with me. Philippians 1.19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. You pray for me, God will save me, and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Wow. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul says, when you pray, 
The spirit of Jesus will set me free from my bondage. Paul, wait, 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 wait. You're a Jew, Paul. You're a Pharisee of Pharisees, a student of Gamaliel, the son of Hillel. You know the Old Testament. You know that the spirit belongs to Jehovah, belongs to God. You're supposed to say the spirit of God, the spirit of Jehovah. How dare you say the spirit of Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is, Paul? Jesus is Jehovah, my God. Hello. That's why I can speak of the spirit of Jesus saving me and delivering me. Did you got it? Why would Paul refer to the spirit of Jehovah God Almighty who empowers God's servants, preserves them, right? Delivers them from the calamities as the spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul, what are you doing? You are a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, student of Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbis, according to rabbinic Judaism, son of Hillel, one of the greatest rabbis. How could you say the spirit of Jesus Christ when you know the Old Testament? Because Jesus Christ revealed himself to me, and he revealed to me that he is Jehovah God that my ancestors worship, who became flesh for my salvation. That's why. I can't help your confusion, Linky. Stay confused because I'm not changing topics. Is that clear? Okay, final one, final one for now. Let's see whose spirit spoke through the prophets. Whose spirit inspired the prophets? Whose spirit instructed the prophets? Zechariah chapter 7, verse 12. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 12. Zechariah 7, verse 12. Zechariah 7, verse 12. Oh, Zechariah 7, 12. This was a super long session. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which Jehovah of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from, the, from Jehovah of hosts. Did you see it? Jehovah of hosts sent his spirit in the prophets to speak through the prophets. Whose spirit spoke through the prophets? Whose spirit was in the prophets instructing them? According to Zechariah 7, 12 here. Whose spirit? Come on. Don't drop the ball on this, man. I swear I'm going to retire. You just read it. Zechariah 7, 12. Okay, Ian, I'll give you $10 million if you guys show me the father. Okay. I think I'm going to stop teaching after today, seriously. I'm saying I really am. How dare you guys say it's the father? How dare you say it's the father? Unbelievable, man. Okay. I'm going to give every one of you $10 million to show me where Zechariah 7, 12 said the Father or said Jesus Christ. Let's try it again. Al, honestly, Al, I don't know how much I can do this, bro. The level of biblical literacy among Christians, um, I don't think I can handle it, honestly. It's not for me. Zechariah 7, 12. Let's try it again. No, buddy, I'm not supposed to teach. You can't force me to teach. If people are not getting it, you move on. So don't ever tell me I'm supposed to teach, Raphael, because you will get blocked. Say it again. Okay. Okay, now let's read Zechariah 7, 12. Let's read it again one more time. 
I'll give you $10 million I don't have if you can show me. If you show me where it says the spirit of the Father or the spirit of Jesus Christ. No, it's not even the word of Jehovah. No, it's not about being slow. It's not about being slow. It's just reading. No, 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 no. Don't use that as an excuse of being slow. It's reading what's in front of your eyes. I mean, you guys can't read? Honestly. Yes, Richard, I will after I muzzle you like the dog that you are. Okay, you wicked dog. Okay, Richard. Okay. Let's try it again. No, it's not your ignorant. Guys, please don't 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 go that route and say we're ignorant. It doesn't require Einstein to read what's in front of your eyes. So it has nothing to do with ignorance unless you can't read and you guys can read, right? So you're not illiterate. Why can't you simply read the verse and see what the verse says? Where did the verse say the Father or Jesus? Why is it hard to simply read and see what it says? Okay, let's see if you get it. One more time. Mega, I'll give you $10 million where it says triune God. Okay, Zechariah 7, 12. Let's try it again. This took too long. I think I'm going to probably delete this uh, session after I'm done. Probably will. Zechariah 7, 12. Let's read it again. I'm waiting for the verse to be posted before the rapture. No, no, it's not about forgiveness, man. It's just, you know, reading. Okay. Okay. What Now, I'm going to give everyone $10 million if you show me where it says, Spirit of the Father, Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of the Triune God. This took longer than necessary. Okay. Whose spirit spoke through the prophets? Whose spirit spoke through the prophets? Whose spirit spoke through the prophet? He just posted it the fifth time. Even Protestants getting tired. Yeah. Yeah. No, brother, King of Kings, that's one of my weaknesses, impatience and anger. And until God gives me victory, I'm I'm failing in this area. So whose spirit? Lord of hosts, thank you. You see how easy it is just to read the text, folks? Why are you adding to the text? It says, Lord of hosts, Hebrew, Jehovah of hosts. You see, you don't need to be Einstein. You don't need a PhD. You just got to read. Why was it hard? Why was it hard to simply quote what was in front of you? This is how I know you're paying attention and you're not paying attention. This is how I know... You're paying attention or you're not paying attention. And if you're not paying attention, you're wasting your time and mine. Honestly, you're wasting your time and mine if you're not paying attention. Right? Okay. Whose spirit spoke in and through the prophets? According to Zechariah 7, 12. Whose spirit? Okay, the spirit of Jehovah of hosts, right? Okay, so it's not, guys, it's not your ignorant, stupid, you're not. It's simply reading the verse. Thank you, Andrew Martin. I really love this guy, man. Okay, so you see what should have took me less than a minute took now 15 minutes, right? The spirit of Jehovah of hosts. Okay. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. Jehovah of hosts. Okay. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. Mega, stop asking me a question that has nothing to do with my question about who's mentioned in the text. How can Jehovah of hosts be the Trinity there when the spirit belongs to Jehovah of hosts? So now you have four persons, the spirit, 
who now belongs to three persons. What are you talking about, Mega Tank? Do you make sense? If Jehovah of Hosts is the Trinity, then the Spirit is part of the Trinity. He can't be the Spirit of the Trinity. Now, my 920. Thou gavest also thy good spirit. In the context, folks, thy good spirit is Jehovah again. If you read chapter 9, it's Jehovah. It doesn't say Father. doesn't say Son. doesn't say Trinity. It says Jehovah. So again, please answer the question. When it says, you gave them your good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst, whose spirit? Whose good spirit is Nehemiah referring to in context? If he's speaking of Jehovah, so I'm giving it to you, Jehovah. Who? So it's Jehovah's good spirit, right? Jehovah, right? Not Father, not Son, not Trinity. Whew. All right. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 30. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 30. I got scared for a minute, man. I seriously I got scared. Al, you following me? No, Elizabeth, don't make excuses. That's not what I said. You're making excuses. Please don't insult my intelligence. I kept saying, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of who? I didn't say nothing about Lord of hosts. Do not insult my intelligence, please. Now, my 9, verse 30. Yet many years didst thou, you, again, it's Jehovah, in the context, forbear them, you put up with them, and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. So let me ask you a question. Whose good spirit, whose spirit was in the prophets, speaking through the prophets, teaching and rebuking Israel? Whose spirit? Praise the Lord Jesus. Honestly, praise the Lord. Okay. Micah 3 8. Micah 3 8. Two hours, man. Who's going to listen to two hours of this? I went down from 137, 128. See, we're losing people. I'm telling you. By the time I'm done, I'm going to be me, myself, and I. Micah 3, 8. Micah 3, 8. Okay, let's see. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, Jehovah. Let's read it again. Okay, Mega. God bless you, Mega. I'll see you in glory. Bye bye. God bless you. Okay. Micah 3 8. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, Jehovah, and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Okay. Let's post it one more time. Jesus had only seven disciples. You mean he didn't have 72 and 12 apostles? Okay. Micah 3 8. <laughs> We're from the class of dangerous minds. <laughs> Micah 3 verse 8. Okay, I like, I like King of Kings. One more time. Okay. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of Jehovah. Please, please, please. I'm going to cry. Please don't make me hang myself with my shoestrings and throw myself out of the first floor window. First floor window. Please, please. Whose spirit is this here? Micah the prophet says, I am full of power by the spirit of who? Please. Don't, don't, don't. I swear, I, I, my shoestrings right now, I'm going to take them, I'm going to hang myself. And there's a first floor window. I'll throw myself right out, right out through that window. Okay. I am full of the power of the spirit of who? Who's, who's, whose spirit here? Jehovah, right? Woo. Yeah, Zena, actually you can. I have about 20 boxes of books. 90% I haven't read. But you can come claim it. Name it and claim it. Okay. I don't that not bro. You know God hasn't given me the grace to be patient yet. We're trusting in it. Okay. So the spirit of Jehovah, right? Okay. Now let me repeat again. According to the old testament. According to the old testament. Who spoke through the prophets 
inspired the prophets, who dwelt in the prophets to teach them to teach and rebuke Israel. Whose spirit was that? The spirit of who? The spirit of who? Jehovah, the Lord, right? Jehovah, the Lord, right? Final one. I know you guys are tired. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Susan, what are you talking about? Jesus had 12 apostles and at least 72 disciples. Please, let's not debate this point. There's no debate there. Okay, Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Hey, sister, how are you? We're almost finished. Sister, you got to go back and listen to the beginning. Two hours of intense fire. I almost committed. Uh, almost. Yeah, yeah. Read this. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The spirit of, and the Hebrew is Adonai Yahovah. The spirit of the Lord Jehovah is upon me. Adonai Yahovah. The spirit, a prophet saying the spirit of the Lord God, the sovereign Jehovah is on me. So one more time. Whose spirit? was on the speaker inspiring him. Whose spirit? Whose spirit was on these prophets, in these prophets, speaking through these prophets? Whose spirit? Whose spirit? Okay. You sure? Guys got it. You sure? Now you're going to see why. Now you're going to appreciate why I took 20 minutes to torture you and me. Because now that it's sunk in, Old Testament, the spirit of Jehovah in the prophets. The spirit of Jehovah speaking to the prophets. The spirit of Jehovah instructing the prophets. The spirit of Jehovah. The spirit of Jehovah. The spirit of Jehovah spoke through the prophets. You know why I took this route? Because now get ready to be mind blown. 1 Peter 1, 10 to 11. Now get ready to be mind blown. Okay. Now you're going to appreciate why I'm tough and rough and I get frustrated and I take so much time. Here you go. First Peter 1, 10 to 11. Watch here. I am tired, Corinth. Honestly, I am. Now you're going to see, Rachel. First Peter 1, 10 to 11. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 11. You're going to see now, Rachel. Pay attention now. Let's see. Now, after 20 minutes, it better rock you, shock you, and blow your minds away. It better. Of which salvation? The prophets. Talking about the Old Testament. The salvation? The prophets looked into, inquired about, and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching when, or what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Bam! Whoa, Peter. Whoa, Peter. Whoa. See, I'm getting I'm acting like a drama queen now. What did you say, Peter? The spirit of Christ was in the prophets of the Old Testament, Peter? Peter, aren't you a Jew? Yeah. You know the Old Testament, right, Peter? Yeah. The Old Testament says that's the spirit of Jehovah God. It's Jehovah's spirit in them. Yeah. How could you say it was the spirit of Jesus in them? Hello. Jesus is Jehovah God. I'm breaking out into the Fatin Shabu song. Do you see now why I had to make sure you were reading the passage carefully? Do you understand now? If you cannot see that the Old Testament says it's the Spirit of Jehovah indwelling the prophets, then you cannot see. How shocking and amazing and mind-blowing what Peter and Paul said when they identified the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
Sal, I won't. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I love Sal. He got a Syrian on me. No, I promise I won't. But you know, it's not going to make me look bad, Sal. You got people after me trying to discredit me like James White because I got anger issues. So this is not going to make me look good. Okay. Is that clear now? Okay. Yeah. To wrap up, to wrap up. Yeah, I have PayPal and Patreon and I'm in full-time ministry. So if you want to prayerfully support me, go ahead. And then you can email me. S-A-M-S-H-M-N at yahoo.com. S-A-M-S-H-M-N at yahoo.com. Okay, let's wrap it up. What did we just learn in today's session? We learned the Father is the head of the Son and the Spirit. So the Father can send the Son and the Spirit. We also learn the Son is the head of the Spirit. So the Father and the Son can send the Spirit, command the Spirit. And because the Father and the Son can command the Spirit, the Spirit belongs to the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit belongs to the Father and the Son. He doesn't just belong to the Father, but to the Son also, because everything that belongs to the Father belongs to the Son. Since the Holy Spirit belongs to the Father, He belongs to the Son. And the Father and the Son have authority over the Spirit. And the Father has authority over the Son, which is why the Father can send them both, which is why the Son can send the Spirit. But you'll never find in Scriptures the Son and the Spirit sending the Father on their behalf. Clear now? If I can teach you, I hope I have been teaching you. Now, in light of the Old Testament, you understand why this is rev revolutionary? In light of the Old Testament, you see why this is revolutionary? Here's why it's revolutionary. For Jews like Paul and Peter, who knew the Old Testament, and knew that the Old Testament says, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jehovah God. The Holy Spirit belongs to Jehovah God. The Holy Spirit is sent out by Jehovah God, proceeds from Jehovah God. For them to then come say, that Holy Spirit is not just the Spirit of God the Father. That Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of His Son is mind-boggling, revolutionary, unheard of in Judaism of that time. They were rocking the Jews and turning their world upside down by saying that. Paul and Peter. You understand now? So this entire session was over two hours of the hierarchical trinity, the economic trinity, the relational trinity. Right? Okay. So let me just end it by telling you, thank you for your prayers. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I've gotten permission. I can leave and relocate, but now I need your prayers that where I'm relocating, they will okay it and say, you can come. Can you pray for that miracle? I need the answer within two weeks. If I get the answer, I'm relocating, and Al knows where I'm going, and I'm going to be having weekly Bible studies there if God wants me to teach. Can you pray? God showed up in an amazing way for me yesterday. Please beg the Lord, Lord, in your grace, give him the green light from that other state, and I'm gone. And please beg God to bring my daughters into my life. And please beg God to provide for me, to provide for them. So I don't depend on anyone but on him through his people to take care of these girls. But I'm going to be honest with you and I'm going to share this. Why don't you want me to leave Illinois? I don't even know. Are you from Illinois? Man, I don't even know you from Illinois. But anyway, okay. Yeah, Zina, I used to do that. Al will tell you. Al used to come to my weekly Bible studies. Al, you're a witness. For over five years, I used to teach at a church from 7 to 10. How was those sessions? For over five years, Al used to attend with his lovely family. How was those sessions? Al. Right here. Five years, and we had the church packed, didn't we? Glory to God, right? Five years. Right? Hey, can you block daily and send him back to Mecca to smooch the black stone? I don't want him in my my Irene. I would like to know who you are that you know so much of me. I'm from Illinois. 
I can't just answer you. I don't know who you are. Anyway, okay, now, here's what I'm going to honestly tell you, honestly. I try to be as honest as I can, but I know I have haters. They're going to hate me and attack me and discredit me, right? I'll be honest with you. I'm being. I'm opening my heart. I want to serve Jesus till I die, and I want to love Jesus perfectly and be in love with him. And if he's called me to teach, I want to continue teaching in the power of the Holy Spirit for his glory. But I'll be very honest with you. I'm going to open my heart right now, okay? I need you guys to listen. You listening? I'm speaking from my heart. You guys ready? Because I want to end it with this. At times, because of my imperfections, my weaknesses, my lack of patience, and my anger that I'm begging God to give me grace to control, because sometimes it just gets the best of me, I get tired and I feel, and I'm not saying this to because I want sympathy or pity. I'm just being honest. I feel like I'm becoming a stumbling block and I need to just step away and disappear and just focus on doing something. Serve Jesus, love Jesus, but without having to teach. And that's how I feel. So there are times in which I say, Lord, you definitely don't need me. And I'm getting frustrated. And in my frustration, I'm causing people to stumble. I don't want to sin against you. If you can release me, release me. So in all honesty, in all honesty, if the Lord were to release me and have me do something else where I can support myself, my children, you wouldn't hear from me again. You wouldn't. Honestly, you wouldn't hear from me because you don't need me. You need Jesus and Jesus raises up people. So there are days in which I'm excited and I'm full with the joy of the Lord. And I feel like, yes, God wants me to do it. And there are days in which I'm like, you know what, man? I'm doing more damage than good. And I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. There's one man in particular that I see. He's now at a point in which he is so disgusting and repulsive. And has become so ungracious, and he has the world hating him. And but in his arrogance, he thinks he's being a soldier for Christ. That when I look at him, I get scared for myself because I'm afraid I'm gonna end up like him. And that's James White. And I want him to hear this. He's become one of the most repulsive and disgusting Christians out there, and he's become of no use because he offends and hurts people and makes people angry and fills their heart with hate. He's now doing more damage than good, but in his arrogance and self-righteousness, he doesn't see it. And I don't want to end up like him. I don't want to end up like him. And I have the potential to be worse than him if God doesn't save me. I'm being honest and upfront, and I'm not lying to you. Okay? I'm being honest and upfront. I don't want to go that route. I'm scared. I am scared because I'll tell you why I'm scared. I'll tell you why. I get very angry quick. I get impatient. I lash out and I don't like to be corrected. And that's all pride. And I'm scared. Right? If someone comes in a spirit of love and shares something with me, I'll listen. But when someone in my flesh, my wicked, filthy flesh, may the Holy Spirit kill my flesh. And I'm scared. I'm being honest. I do not want to end up like this guy. I used to love this guy and look up to this guy. What he's become, he's become so disgusting. And guys, don't take my word for it. Go look at his face. I just watched the clip. Even his face, he looks so unhealthy and so just demonically oppressed, wickedly demonic look. And that's because there's demonization taking place. And I don't care if people hate me for saying it. And he scares me because that can be me. So... I need you guys to pray for me that God will speak to me. And I know God is speaking to me and telling me that his hand is on me and wants me to teach till I die. Because in reality, I am tired of myself and my failures because I don't want to be a stumbling block and I don't want to fall like this man. I am scared. Honest to God, I'm scared when I see him. Okay. So... I'm opening my heart. Pray for me. God will release me. Pray for a good report that I get the okay green light from the other state and I'm gone. But one thing I can tell you, I haven't seen my girls in months and my heart aches for them. I am dying without my girls. But God has strengthened me to let them go because he will fight and bring them to me. 
because of a wicked, filthy, corrupt judicial system and a woman who decided to indulge her flesh and become immoral and not fear the Lord. Pray for their deliverance, their mother's salvation and repentance, and pray for my purity. And ask the Lord to speak to me and let me know, does he want me to continue to teach? Because I'm ready, honestly. I've been like this. I felt like this. I'm ready to say I need to step away. Right. Yes, they are, Raphael. But I hope you guys were blessed. So you guys don't want me to delete this, right? You want me to save it? Okay, save it. Okay. Pray for me and ask God to speak to me clearly. Okay. Speak to me clear. Another son of Satan, a pig, a filthy dog Satan attacking me. Ask the Lord Jesus to keep me pure and to just speak to me. Speak to me, especially in my loneliness. Folks, it's hard. For two years, I've been without my children. It's lonely without them. Pray that God will comfort me somehow. If God wants me to be celibate, he is worthy. I'll be like the Apostle Paul. If he wants me to find a godly companion, ask the Lord to make it clear sooner than later. And my angels, I miss them. And Andrew, I just want to say something. I love you. And Andrew, even though you say you're an atheist at heart, you are really a Christian because I can see you're in love with Jesus. And it's a matter of time you're going to start teaching and preaching the gospel again, sooner than later in Jesus' name. I hope I didn't offend you guys. Sorry for my frustration. I love you guys. And that's why I get angry at myself when I'm frustrated because I don't want to be a stumbling block to you guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Jesus is alive. He is real. The Bible is his word. He is God in the flesh. He is one with the Father and the Spirit. He does love and adore us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are in love with him. We love you, Lord Jesus. We want to be in love with you, Lord Jesus. We want to adore you, Lord Jesus. You are our life. You are my life. You are my life, even though I fail you. Please, Lord Jesus, never let us go. And please, Lord Jesus, watch over our children, our loved ones. Watch over my angels. Watch over them, Lord, please. And give us the grace to live for you and die for you. We love you, Jesus. God bless you. See you soon. Christ is risen indeed.